this here is the future home of the actual live controller. What we've got is a bog standard Rosewill 4U rack mount server case. And this particular aluminum plate here served the same uh, purpose as the plate that was on the prototype, except now we've gone ahead and cut it to fit the ATX motherboard standard. All these holes along here are designed to line up with the holes that fit into a standard case. And you can see that it actually fits really well. I've gone ahead and taken the drive uh, cages out. There's lots of room in here, and each one of these places here shows where the components are going to fit in the final design. We've got lots of space. We could actually expand this to fit another axis if we wanted. And I've cut this plate on the X-Carve. So the X-Carve cut all the holes for the mounting bolts and engraved these profiles along with some callouts for the threads that I had to do uh, to make it all fit. This is one of the reasons why CNC is so powerful. That you're going to go ahead and do a design, you can work it out in your CAD program run it through and now I'm not trying to make X and Y measurements to precisely locate these holes. I can go right off the spec and the X-Carve cuts it and it fits right in. So this kind of ability is what we're looking to do by building a CUC controller in the first place. Uh, a little tip for when you've got to go ahead and cut some of these holes or threaded, rather than the rest of the tap handle, you just put it in your drill press and use the drill press unpowered to get the thing started, then you pull it out of the drill press and finish it up with the rest of the top handle. It's an old machinist trick. These fans here are 12 volt. I'm not sure how well they're going to work with the 5 volt power supply that drives the whole thing, but uh, I have a, a little bird at Noctura told me that they're going to be coming out with 80 millimeter 5 volt fans uh, in about a month, so I'll be going ahead and changing those fans over. But you can see how nicely this works. You don't have to go and build yourself an expensive custom enclosure. You don't have to go and, and spend a whole lot of money to design your own thing. And once it's finished, it fits into a standard rack mount case, so you can mount it almost anywhere. In fact, I'm going to probably change the shop computer over to a rack mount to go with it, just because it makes it easier to work with. Let's go ahead and mount some of these components and see how it looks. So there we are. We have all the components mounted on the tray, and uh, you can see how it's going to fit. We still need the additional power supply that goes here. And we still have another driver that goes here to hook up. Some of the wiring didn't quite fit from the prototype to this, but you can certainly see how the layout works and how it's all going to fit very nicely in that case. The next step is to make a block off plate that fits where the ATX power supply normally goes. That's where the hookup for the AC will go. That will run forward to a switch that goes in here. From the switch to a series of circuit breakers it will fit here. And from the circuit breakers, it'll either go to a bus or perhaps a wire directly to, to power up this power supply, this power supply, and, and that power supply. For the connector to go out to the stepper motors, two holes will go in here. Actually, probably three because i got to hook up uh, limit switches. Those will go on the side of the case, and I've got some aircraft connectors that I have to hook up there that will act as pickups for the outside. So as far as clearance goes from the top of the power supply, there's a good uh, two inches there. So that's plenty of space. That's a nice fit. When the whole thing is finished, that's going to make a very professional sort of layout. Uh, so fabrication parts to go yet. Need to make the block off plate for here. Need to make a adapter plate for here. Need to make a block off plate for the drive bays or adapt the ones that came with it. But the good news is, is that all this stuff is ATX standard. So there's documents you can download on the web that tells exactly the interface that these things need to be. Why reinvent the wheel? Somebody's already gone through the work of figuring out how to do an electronics enclosure. Let's just use that for our own stuff. So the next step is to start machining some of these plates. All right. It is everybody's favorite time, CNC pouring time. We're going to go ahead and cut the back plate for the power supply where we're going to hook up the connector for the AC adapter. And uh, we're going to cut it out of this piece of aluminum using the X-Carve. And yes, I know I haven't done a video on the X-Carve. I'm going to at some point. But for now, just sit back and enjoy the show.
now that we have all the holes drilled into it, let's go ahead and part it off. Or maybe we'll just go ahead and break a bit. I guess I'll have to check the feeds and speeds because I thought that was okay. Yeehaw. All right, parting off round two. God damn it. Well, this is a good lesson, I suppose. It's almost through, too. At least that's probably through enough I can break it off. They were only one day away from retirement. So there's the result of all that work. All the holes have been tapped in the plate. It's been fitted in place. And you can see the AC hookup point there so we can bring AC into the unit. So here we are all together. This is our rack mount case. And here is the aluminum plate that we machined on the X-Carve using the same dimensions as an ATX motherboard to mount all the components to. On this side we have an aluminum plate machined on the X-Carve to fit the same space as the standard ATX power supply. Except now we have a power plug in here that comes to the wall. On this side it's soldered to three lines. They go over to this switch over here, which switches both neutral and line at the same time. And ground goes down to the common ground here of the aluminum plate. That switch is designed to switch out both line and neutral, so that way it de-energizes the entire box. And the only time I have full power going is just from this space here to this space here. From the switch, we go to this power distribution block. Each one of these terminals is electrically isolated from this side, but it connects on this side. So we have the line going to this terminal here, and we have the neutral going to this terminal here. The line side goes up to these three circuit breakers, which are marine circuit breakers. Uh, they look a lot like aircraft circuit breakers, so they're nice and compact and neat. And these things are way better than fuses, because if it blows, you just have to find the problem and reset the breaker. You don't have to go hunting for a glass fuse that is now popped. And uh, it's a reasonable expectation we may pop one or two while we're building this thing. Each one of these line connections is then routed from a circuit breaker to its appropriate power supply. So we have a 5 volt power supply here, which runs the electronics inside the box. We have a 48 volt power supply here, which is set up to supply this motor driver. And we have a 48 volt power supply here, which drives this motor driver. These power supplies are sized to best fit the power demands of the motor. And in fact, if anything, they're a little bit generous, because at one point in time I thought I might run all three off the same power supply, and then I'd change my mind later on. So, basically that's it. Line, power supplies. Neutral, same deal. Neutral goes to each one of the, of the power supplies. Uh, it doesn't have to go through a breaker, because you only have to switch one side of the circuit. From each one of these power supplies, you then have DC power that goes to... This is the X-axis controller, and this is the Z-axis controller. And from there, out these wires to the stepper motors. This piece here is the smooth stepper motion control board. This side is the 
Ethernet cable that goes to the computer, which commands the motions. These are signal wires and grounds that run from the stepper motor controller board to the two stepper motor controllers, right there and there. And eventually, when I add in spindle control, there will also be a line that runs from there to the spindle control as well. We've also wired in some fans, the two that came with the case, and another one here, a 5-volt one that I bought. I just put some airflow on here. Those are also wired into the 5-volt power supply. Uh, turns out 12-volt fans work just fine on 5 volts. Probably wouldn't work too well on 48, so I wired them into the 5-volt supply. And that's really all there is to it. This is not rocket science. It's just Lego. These things need DC voltage to route to here, so you need an AC-DC power supply to convert AC to DC. This thing needs 5 volts, so you need a 5 volt power supply. To feed all these things, you need to have a distribution block, and it has to be circuit breakers. You put the circuit breakers into it. This is all very straightforward industry Lego stuff. One difference from the prototype is that on we've, we've added a different kind of motor driver. So this motor driver is a very simple current chopper. It takes a pulse in a direction and then converts that. As, it's basically a big relay and it runs it down to the stepper motor here. Where this one has a bit of an issue is that the controller has no idea on whether or not the pulse that it commanded ever actually got there. So this thing here will say, all right, I gotta move 12 steps counterclockwise and it'll tell it to move 12 steps counterclockwise and it just trusts that it happens. So you have no way of knowing, either in the controller or upstream, whether or not the thing actually made it to where it's supposed to go. This one here, and this particular driver is a hybrid. It uses servo technology where it has a sensor inside the motor that tells it where it's positioned. It's also got an extra wire. You'll notice this one's got two wires coming out of it. This has only got one. That's because on this end, you've got the four wires for power, step and direction right here, but you've also got sensors that tell it where the motor actually made it. So what this thing can do is say, command 12 steps, and then it checks and goes, did I get 12 steps? And if it didn't, it can ramp up the power to the motor until it gets its 12 steps. And if it ramps up the power and the motor never gets there, well, then we know there's a fault in the motor someplace and it throws an alarm. So this one is way more powerful than this one because this one, you, you'll probably never stole that motor out. Whereas this one here, you can if, you've, if you manage to load it up. I'm going to use this on the x-axis on the cross slide where the forces involved are pretty small. This one here I'm going to use on the carriage where you're typically moving back and forth for the cuts like this. Uh, you generally don't take a whole lot of really deep facing cuts, although grooving, maybe we'll see. But uh, I'm trusting this bad boy here to be a whole lot stronger than this one on the axis that I need it for. And also it's a little bit of a, well, let's give it a try and, and see what happens because this is really sort of common technology. You see these things all the time. These ones are a little bit more rare. And uh, I want to see if the extra expense, it's probably about 25% more, uh, and the extra complexity of the extra wire is, is worth the squeeze. Uh, left to do on this particular part of the project, a spindle control driver is going to go in this space up here. I decided kind of after the fact that that's, I wanted to add spindle control, so I didn't have space for it on the board, so now it's going to go here. And uh, I also need a way to route these wires outside, so I have what's called the aircraft connectors. They're kind of like a, a more sophisticated microphone connector. Uh, I'll be installing them here, out the side, so that way we don't have to have wires dangling out or, or hardwired into this. You can, you can remove them if necessary. All right, so we're ready to give this thing a try, so let's just go ahead and power it up. And nothing went boom. That's a good sign. Switch it on. Quick little honk from the motor. Okay, so we have green lights everywhere. Green light on the ESS. We have green lights on all the power supplies and all the motor drivers. And we've got Mach 4 turned on and Mach 4 is happy and it says that it sees the thing. I've already gone through and done the, all the configuration, so all I have to do is enable. And we'll put it on jog. And we go X. In the direction. And Z. In the direction. And look at that, we have motion. Even go ahead and load a program here. We'll run the program. And you can see that the controller thinks it's doing something. Because we're going ahead and we're advancing the carriage on a cut. 
and then it feeds in some stuff, and that's the end of that program. So anyway, you can see that she works. We still have some tuning to do as far as motors are concerned, but we have to wait until they're attached to the lathe to get that right anyways. Uh, right now, the bottom line is, is I can command motion in mock, and I get motion out of the two steppers, and I do pretty much what I expect them to do. So, progress. Before I go, I also want to draw some attention to this. This is the original switch that I used to power this device. I've had a lot of good luck with Chinese components. All the power supplies and the motor drivers and the motors and, well, pretty much everything in this project so far has been Chinese. This is a Chinese switch that I picked up from Amazon. And notwithstanding the fact that it says it is rated for the kind of loads that I'm going to put it in, as soon as I flipped that thing on, there was a bright orange flash and it failed on. I got two of them for the, that price, Swip, swapped in its brother, put it in, I got two cycles out of it before bright orange flash and it failed on as well. And I pulled it open to have a look why, and what happened was, is the terminals inside spot welded themselves to their mating terminals. So, uh, sometimes you get what you pay for, I'm afraid. That was a $1 switch, and it lasted for two cycles. The one that I installed over there was a uh, domestically made uh, CSA rated one. Uh, I got it from Mouser Electronics. It cost 12 bucks, but uh, that one I've been able to flip on and off at least a dozen times, and so far it hasn't welded itself on. So, uh, well, you got to be careful. Sometimes the Chinese stuff works, and sometimes it doesn't. Anyway, that's enough for now. Thanks for watching. Let me grab my Peter. Quick.